Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel if you are new here, I hope you're all doing well. Welcome back to another episode of True Crime and Makeup. This case has been living in my head rent free for the longest time and I just decided that I needed to cover it. I think it's a really important one. It's one that I don't feel is talked about enough and that is the case of George Junius Stinney Jr. George Stinney was the youngest person in US history to face capital punishment at only 14 years old. He was convicted and sentenced to death with literally no evidence to even convict him in the first place. Unfortunately, this crime was in a time where a lot of racial injustice was happening and I know it still goes on to this day. George Stinney was just 14 years old when he was executed in South Carolina in 1944. It only took 10 minutes to convict him yet it took 70 years to exonerate him after his death. I do want to give a heads up that this case does touch on a lot of very heavy subjects. For me personally, I do feel like this conviction was purely racially motivated and it is just horrendous what happened to George Stinney. I have tried my very best to go through this case and be mindful but if there's anything that I've said or not worded quite correctly then please let me know down below. Um, I have done my very best. I mean absolutely no disrespect if anything's said incorrectly. I think this case is absolutely heartbreaking and devastating for everyone involved and to think that things like this happen not just then but even to this day this sort of stuff goes on it needs to be stopped. But if you do enjoy true crime and you're interested in makeup, it would mean the world to me if you could subscribe to my channel. I will leave everything linked down below that you need. So all my social media, any products that I've used on my face today will be linked below as well. Obviously, this is true crime and makeup. The sole purpose of doing my makeup whilst I discuss these cases is just to give me something else to focus on. As you'll see in this case, it is quite an emotional one and... I really just need a bit of therapy whilst I discuss these cases so that is the only reason that I do my makeup. It's not to be disrespectful in any way but I am going to stop rambling now and I'm just going to get right on into the case of George Stinney Jr. So George Junius Stinney Jr. was born on the 21st of October 1929 and he was born in Pinewood, South Carolina. He was one of five children to George Junius Stinney Sr. and also Amy Brown Stinney. So he had two brothers, so he had Charles Stinney and then he had a half brother named John and then his two sisters Amy and Catherine Stinney and from what I could gather they were very close as a family, they were a very hard working family as well and they did live in quite a small house but it had like a little chicken coop outside and this was in the town of Alcalo which just sounds so cute. Now George's dad, what George Senior, he worked in the town's local sawmill and so the family stayed in like company housing which I believe is housing given to the employees of the company. Correct me if I'm wrong but I think that's what it is. Now during the time that this case was taking place I don't know how common it was in every other area but particularly in Alcalo, South Carolina there was black and white segregation. So the town of Alcalo was actually separated by railroad tracks. So it was black families on one side, white families on the other side. Churches and schools were also split as well. So there would be schools for the black children, schools for the white children, churches, etc. And because of the way that they were all segregated, it was really quite rare that black children and white children would actually get the chance to interact and be within each other's company, which I, I just hate stuff like this. I hate anything that's racist. I cannot stand it. I think it's the most disgusting thing ever. So in the time in 1944, George Stinney stood at five foot one inches and ranged anywhere between 90 to 95 pounds. On March the 23rd, 1944, 
Mary Emma Thames, who was only seven years old, and Betty June Binnaker, who was 11 years old, were out that day riding their bikes. Now, due to the nature and the circumstances of this case, I do have to preface that these young girls wear white. Well, they're out one day, they're riding their bikes, they were out looking for maypops, which apparently is like some kind of edible passion flower. So they were riding their bikes like through the woods, through the town of Alcalou, and unfortunately that night, the young girls wouldn't return. Now, everyone was saying that the last time these young girls were seen was when they had rode by the Stinney property and they had spoken to George Stinney Jr. as well as his young sister, Amy, and they had basically asked George and Amy, do they know where to find the Maypops, the flowers? And Alcalou, with it being a small town, the news did travel fast. Unfortunately, two little girls had went missing and hadn't come home that night. So the whole town of Alcalou, they got out, they went hunting for the young girls. And this did include George Stinney Sr. He was also out helping and trying to find them and trying to get the girls home. It was then on the 24th of March, 1944, so the next day, that the lifeless bodies of Betty and Mary were found in a soggy ditch that just so happened to be on the African-American side of the small town of Alcalou. And it was reported that both of these beautiful young girls had been brutally beaten, brutally assaulted with either like a railroad spike or some sort of blunt object with like a round head to it. They said almost like the size of a hammer was what was used to brutally attack the young girls. And... It's horrible, but unfortunately, the severe blunt force trauma that they both had actually caused penetration of the skull. So it was, it was hard enough to cave in certain parts of their skulls. And when examining the bodies of the girls, it was said that Mary had a hole that went right through her forehead, as well as a two inch open wound, like a cut above her right eyebrow. Then with young Betty, it was said that she suffered approximately seven blows to her head. And the medical examiner did say that the back of her skull was basically just a mass of crushed bones. She had been so brutally attacked and brutally assaulted with whatever object it was that it literally crushed the back of her skull into small fragments. The medical examiner was also able to tell that young Mary had no evidence of sexual assault on her body whatsoever. But unfortunately with Betty, there was actually evidence of bruising on her genitalia. On the day that these young girls went missing, there was a rumour going around town that they had actually visited the home of a very prominent white family within Alcalou, but the police did not want to hear this. They did not want to believe for a second that these crimes could have been committed by a white person. From the second they heard about these crimes and the fact that the young girls were found on the African-American side of the railroad track in Alcalou, they wanted a black person done for this murder. I hate this stuff. And do you, know, do you know what's so sickening is the fact that they're jumping the gun and deciding that they believe it's a black person that's committed this crime when the father of George Stinney, George Stinney Sr., was one of the most helpful people in trying to find these young girls. He wanted to get them home to their family, but because of their skin colour, they're automatically seen as the criminals. It's baffling to me. Like, racism baffles my brain. I don't get it. So a so-called witness then came forward to the Clarendon County Law Enforcement and they stated that they had seen the girls on the day that they had been murdered and the very last person they seen the young girls speak to was George Stinney, an African-American young 14-year-old boy. So on the back of this witness sighting, the Clarendon County Police, they went straight to the Stinney family home and they actually arrested George Stinney Jr. immediately. They cuffed him, they took him in for questioning. It was in this tiny, tiny, small room. It was for hours on end. He wasn't allowed an attorney. He wasn't allowed any witnesses and his parents weren't allowed to be present either. 
Now, I will also state that when George was arrested, his brother John, you know, his half-brother John, he was arrested with George, but he was basically let go straight away. And it was just George that they were focusing on. So once George had been remanded in custody, he was then not allowed to speak to his parents, his siblings or anyone until after his trial and conviction. He wasn't allowed to see anyone. This poor boy, this poor young child, child at 14 years old, was not allowed to see anyone during the scariest time of his life. There was no comfort for him whatsoever. Now, one of the police officers that were interrogating George for all these hours had actually said that George had confessed to murdering both Mary and Betty after his plans to have sex with one of the girls failed. So ultimately he believed that he just needed to kill them. An officer by the name of H.M. Newman had declared in a handwritten statement saying, I arrested a boy by the name of George Stinney. He then made a confession and told me where to find a piece of iron about 15 inches long. He said he put it in a ditch about six feet away from the bicycle. And Newman had refused to confirm where George Stinney had been detained because there was rumours going around the town that a lynch mob was going to form. And because of this, not even his parents were allowed to know where George was being held. And obviously in this environment anyway, it's going to be so stressful for his parents and his siblings, not even knowing where he's being held, but also that he's having to go through this awful time all alone, without his mum, without his dad, without that comfort from them. It's just disgusting. It was then later confirmed that George had been being held at a jail within Columbia, which is actually 50 miles from Alcala. Can you believe at this time, the age of 14 was basically deemed like you're responsible. Like 14 was considered the age of responsibility. And because of this, George Stinney was thought to be responsible for the murder. Now, let me just take a second here, right? This poor boy is going to go on trial and he will be convicted over something, words, words spoken by an officer. There was no signed confession. There was no taped confession, obviously, but there was nothing on paper that said that George Stinney admitted to this. And then following the arrest of his son, George Stinney Sr. actually ended up losing his job at the local sawmill, which therefore meant that his family then got evacuated from the company housing that they were in. And the family did wind up having to completely leave the area because they were in so much fear for their lives because everybody was after them. Everybody was believing that poor George Stinney Jr. was guilty of these horrific crimes. But the entire proceedings against George Stinney Jr. and this included the jury selection, all took place on April the 24th, 1944. Fortunately, because the Stinney family didn't have a lot of finances, George Stinney Jr. was appointed like a court appointed attorney, which ended up being Charles Plowden. In my opinion, this man had no intentions of ever given George Stinney Jr. the defence counsel that he needed for this trial. It's worth saying as well, with Charles Plowden, he was a tax commissioner that was actually campaigning for election to local office. Do you think that that man had any intention of getting a young African-American boy off when it was going to be the white community deciding who got voted in? I don't think so. No. Not at all. This man had no intention of defending George Stinney Jr. And I will, I will die on that hill. George Stinney Jr. deserved better. So three officers went up and testified in court to say that George Stinney Jr. had confessed to them. Not once did Charles Plowden even comment on it let alone challenge them. He just let them testify, do their thing, step off, no cross-examination, nothing. There was not a single time in this trial where Charles Plowden made any attempt to defend George. And the prosecution had actually given two very different presentations of George Stinney's confession. So they did not match up. They did not line up, not even close. There were so many differences that could easily have been picked apart 
but Charles Plowden just ignored it. In one of the so-called confessions that I do not believe happened, it said that George Sinney was attacked by both of the young girls after he tried to help one of the girls get out of the ditch and then apparently George Sinney killed both of them in self-defence. That's the first so-called confession. In the other version, they tried to say that George Stinney was following these young girls and he first of all attacked Mary before then attacking Betty for no reason. And I need to state once more that there is no record of a confession from George Stinney Jr. Not a single thing. There is no written confession. The only thing they have at this point is the verbal confirmation from that Police, Newman, him, H.M. Newman, him. He is to blame. So other than the three officers who testified, they only then called another three witnesses. So the first witness that the prosecution called to the stand was Reverend Francis Batson. And he was actually the man who had discovered the bodies of the two young girls in the ditch. And then the other two were the post-mortem examination experts who performed a post-mortem on both the girls. The court also allowed the discussion of the possibility of rape. Now, during the trial, there was more than 1,000 white Americans crowded in the courtroom. Not a single black American was allowed to enter the courtroom whatsoever. And apparently at this time, that was pretty typical and pretty normal, which it should never have been. It should have been that anyone and everyone could go into that courtroom and watch that trial unfold because I can't help that if we had some of the, the black community of Alkalu in that courtroom, someone would have made their voice heard. I also think a huge part of this that's just so disgustingly wrong is that George Stinney Jr. was tried in front of an all-white jury. An all-white jury in this time period, it's, it's only going to go one way. And honestly, just when you think that this whole thing cannot get any worse, it really does. The jury deliberated for only 10 minutes before deciding that George Stinney Jr. was guilty of murdering both of those young girls. Then Judge Philip H. Stoll decided on that day that George Stinney was sentenced to death by electrocution on April 24th, 1944. A 14 year old boy being sentenced to death for something that there is no evidence against. There's no evidence against this young boy to say that he's done it apart from that Newman who gave like a written statement that didn't even confirm anything. George didn't sign anything, George didn't say anything and George didn't confess to anything. It's also worth just concluding to you guys as well that for this trial there was never any transcript provided. There was no appeal by George Stinney Jr.'s counsel. There, like, there was no means to help the boy. They were just like, okay, he's guilty, sentenced to death, that's it, done. Now, George Stinney's family did, of course, appeal this along with the help of the churches and also the NAACP. They actually appealed to Governor Olin D. Johnston in the hopes that he would grant clemency for George. I think the main thing that they were going off is his age, you know, the age of 14, should he really be sentenced to death when there really isn't enough evidence to convict the boy? And this really surprised me if I'm honest, but most of the pleas for clemency came from white women within South Carolina. There was other pleas that came from other white people that basically gave affirmations of white supremacy but also requested clemency given young George's age and they believed that no 14 year old should be sentenced to death regardless of the crimes committed. On it, see just saying the words white supremacy just makes me feel sick to my stomach like nah. Like a really sad thing is as well is that there was also other white people who wrote in and begged the governor to go ahead with the execution, begged the governor to sentence George to death and let it all go ahead, which he did. Now the governor actually visited George Stinney in the death house two days before his sentence and this is what he had to say after it. I am going to read this word for word because I don't want to mess it up because I think this is absolutely disgusting and I just want you to hear it word for word. So the governor said, 
I have just talked with the officer who made the arrest in this case. It may be interesting for you to know that Stinney killed the smaller girl to rape the larger one. Then he killed the larger girl and raped her dead body. 20 minutes later, he returned and attempted to rape her again, but said that her body was too cold. All of this, he admitted himself. <laughs> Again, there's no evidence of this bar the governor's own bloody words trying to say that this is what happened. And of course, it was reported that what he said there is merely rumours because the girl's autopsies did not line up with what he was saying George did. So why like, why is this evidence not being pushed by George's defence counsel, if we can even call him that, because it's absolutely shambolic? And there was actually hundreds and hundreds of letters and telegrams that poured into the governor's office begging for him to show George some mercy. And it even stemmed from like basic ideas of just fairness to then the ideas of Christian justice. Between the time of George Stinney Jr's arrest, his family were allowed to see him once after his trial at Columbia Penitentiary. Could you imagine that? Your child is going through this horrendous ordeal and you as a family are going through it as well and you're allowed to see your 14 year old son once <sighs> i'm sorry th this this whole thing is just horrendous to me i just <sighs> and the thing that like absolutely breaks my heart in this case is when his parents are going to see him they know that there's absolutely nothing that they can do for him like they've tried their best but ultimately their son's gonna die. I just want to give an FYI for the next bit. It is very hard. It's it's a very emotional thing to get through and I'm going to try my best to get through it and hopefully hold it together because I do find it really emotionally difficult but here we go. On June the 16th 1944 just 83 days after George's initial arrest, George Junius Stinney Jr. walked into the execution chamber. He was walked in by four guards from the South Carolina State Penitentiary and he was holding his Bible under his arm and he was wearing socks but no shoes. At the time, George only weighed 95 pounds and he was dressed in a very oversized large striped jumpsuit and he was strapped into an adult sized electric chair and it's actually reported that because he was so small only five foot one that his bible that he carried in with him was actually used as like a booster seat to prop him up and he was also so small that the state electrician really struggled to adjust an electrode to his right leg an officer had then asked george if he had any last words to which george replied no sir and then the officer pushed at George again and said, are you sure that there's nothing you want to say about the crimes that you've committed? To which young George replied, no, sir. It was at that point that a very oversized large mask was placed over George Stinney's face. And at this point, George began to sob and there was tears streaming down his face as well. It's actually said that when the electric volts went through George Stinney's body, that because the mask was far too big for him, it actually slipped down, which revealed tears streaming down his face with his eyes rolled back in his head. Now, I will say that the niece of Mary Emma's mother, she did say that this was just a rumour and that the mask didn't slip down and also stated that his Bible wasn't used as a booster seat. But there is many other people from that time that stated differently. George Junius Stinney Jr. was reported dead shortly after the votes went through his body. And to let it sink in, in the span of just 83 days, George Stinney had been charged with murder, tried, convicted and executed by the state. In 2004, there was a local historian by the name of George Frierson and he had actually grew up in Alcalou and he began researching and looking into George Stinney's case when he had seen a newspaper article about it. With this, the work that he was putting into the George Stinney case actually began getting quite a bit of attention, specifically from South Carolina lawyers. These South Carolina lawyers ended up putting in several countless hours worth of work reviewing 
historical articles, old documents, whatever they could find. They also were trying their best to find any witnesses or evidence that would help assist in the possibility of exonerating George Stinney all these years later. Now Frierson and the pro bono lawyers that had happily came on board and really wanted to help, they did first seek relief through the Pardon and Parole Board of South Carolina and George Frierson had actually stated in interviews that there had actually been a name floating around of someone who was actually thought to be the real culprit of the murders of Mary and Betty and apparently that there was a deathbed confession by a member of a very prominent white family in Alcalou. I don't know if you remember, but it was said that on the day of the murders of the young girls that they were actually last seen at the house of a prominent white family in Alcalou. But those were disregarded and they immediately went for George Stinney. And it's very much worth stating that within this family, there were members of the family who were actually involved and served on the initial coroner's inquest jury. And with this, they had recommended that Stinney be prosecuted and therefore executed. And it was actually said that there was very much very compelling evidence that stated that George Stinney was actually innocent of the crimes that he was executed for in 1944. Like, there was compelling evidence to say that he was innocent. The prosecutor at the time had relied solely on one piece of evidence, which wasn't even evidence because it was the unsigned confession of a 14-year-old, apparently, that H.M. Newman had stated. And let's just remember that this same 14-year-old was deprived of counsel, deprived of any support, deprived of any witnesses, and also deprived of any parental guidance because he got to see his parents once. And even his defence lawyer, who failed to call any useful witnesses to the stand or appeal his conviction of execution, he was failed in so many ways, it is actually ridiculous. New evidence in the court hearing of January 2014, and the testimony included from Stinney's siblings that Stinney was with them at the time these murders were committed. There was also an affidavit introduced that was from Reverend Francis Batson that actually said with the girls, when he had pulled them out of the water-filled ditch when he found them, in his statement he actually recalls that there wasn't barely any blood in or around the ditch, which made Batson assume that the bodies had been taken from elsewhere, like the murder was committed elsewhere, and then the girls were thrown in the ditch on the African-American side of Alcalou to frame someone. Then we also have Wilfred Johnny Hunter, who was imprisoned with Stinney at the same time, and he said that Stinney told him all the time that he was not guilty. He did not commit these crimes. He did not hurt those girls. He was not guilty. And this was in prison when he, like, he had nothing else to give, and he was still adamant of his innocence. And Wilfred Hunter 100% believed him. And Stinney had actually told Hunter at the time that he was forced into making this confession. And he actually testified that for him as well. On December the 16th of 2014, rather than allowing a new trial, court judge Carmen Mullen vacated Stinney's conviction. Judge Mullen had ruled that George Stinney Jr. did not receive a fair trial and he was not effectively defended, and also his Sixth Amendment rights had been completely violated. Judge Mullen had actually ruled that the confession that was apparently given by George Stinney would very much have been a coerced confession, and therefore would have been inadmissible. She also said that she found the execution of a 14-year-old child to be absolutely cruel and a very unusual punishment. She also said that his defence failed to call the witnesses required or even violated his right to appeal the trial as well. And I just want to read this bit word for word that I've got written down. So it says, Mullen confined her judgment to the process of the prosecution, noting that Stinney may well have committed this crime. With reference to the legal process, Mullen wrote, no one can justify a 14-year-old child charged, tried, convicted and executed in some 80 days, concluding that, in essence, not much was done for this child when his life lay in the balance. Yeah, like absolutely retweet. George Junius Stinney Jr. 
was exonerated of all charges in 2014, 70 years after he was convicted and sentenced to death. Finney's siblings actually lived to see their brother's name be exonerated and cleared, which they just couldn't even put into words the relief and the weight that was lifted when George's name was finally cleared. And while that doesn't bring George Stinney back, it certainly lets his legacy rest as it should, innocently. So guys, that is the end of the case of George Stinney. I hope I've done this justice because it's one of those cases that I think is just so important and so devastatingly horrific and I think more people need to know about cases like this and these injustices that we are seeing that happened to George Stinney very much still happen to this very day and I just wish there was more that we can do. If there is more that we can do then let's band together and get it done and like I was saying at the end it doesn't bring George back but I am so happy for George and for his family, for his legacy, that he finally got exonerated. Like, he should have been in the first place. There was no reason that that young boy should have been convicted. And I, hand on heart, truly believe that he was only convicted due to his skin colour and nothing else, which is just, it's so wrong. And I can't believe that things like that used to happen and still happen to this day because we're all just humans. I just can't believe it. If you did enjoy this case or enjoy is probably the wrong word but if you did find it interesting please leave some case recommendations down below. Um, you can also send them along to my email which I will pop up on the screen now for you if you want to send it over there instead. It would mean the absolute world to me if you would like, comment and subscribe. Maybe put the notification bell on so you don't miss when I upload. I do cover two to three cases per week at the moment. Every case is important to tell, but there's those certain ones that just really hit home and I feel like the case of George Stinney is one of them. But I hope, like me, this case is one that you remember and one that you frequently think of and talk about when you're discussing true crime with a friend or a family member. If you want to know any details of what I've used on my face today, as per usual, it will be down in the description below with all the links to the products if there's something that you would like to pick up. My social medias are also listed down below, so you've got my Instagram, my TikTok if you want to give me a follow there, but ultimately the main one is subscribing to my YouTube channel. But that's it for today's case. I hope you enjoyed and until next time, I'll see you later. Bye!